<coughs> so I will proceed with uh, the first of the presentations. Um, uh, my name is Aaron Russell. Um, so I'm presenting on forest commons, impact of forest commons, and agroforestry concessions on household resilience in southern Laos. This is a fun research that has been funded by uh, two uh, multi-donor trust funds within the World Bank, Profor and the uh, Trust Fund for Environmental and Social Sustainability. I think I got them all. Um, and in collaboration with national partners in Laos, the Department of Forestry and the Forestry Research Institute. Center, sorry. <coughs> As a brief introduction to Laos, it is a landlocked country in Southeast Asia. Um, the highlighted uh, block there, that is the district where we're actually focusing our, our research on, and that actually, that should be Savanakhet, the one right above it, excuse me. We, uh, we moved, we, we changed uh, provinces uh, since we did this, uh, this slide. Um, roughly 41% of the country is, is, is uh, claimed to be under forest cover, so it's relatively high. Um, there is a high importance of NTFPs in local, in, in local culinary uh, traditions, and uh, both urban and rural uh, stakeholders ha have a remarkably high consumption of non-timber forest products in their, in, their, in their daily diets. The national development narrative is dominated, however, on, on uh, attracting foreign direct investment, particularly through land use intensification. Key forestry policies uh, that, that or key policy context that this re research relates to, um, there's a national economic development plan, which has a number of very ambitious uh, goals for uh, economic development, including uh, uh, maintaining 8% economic growth, reducing poverty significantly, emerging from the least develop developed countries category by 2020, uh, and much of this is stipulated on an expansion of, uh, of foreign direct investment, uh, including a development of plantations. <coughs> then you have the forestry strategy, uh, which aims to restore forest, in quotes, because forest is to include anything that is tree-like. Um, so uh, restore forest cover to 70% by 2020. Even if you include plantations uh, as forests, it is clear that there, there, it may be difficult to achieve both of these objectives as, as much of the land use intensification is aimed at agricultural concessions rather than, than tree uh, production. <clears throat> there is also an increasing kind of uh, movement pressure, largely stimulated by, by donor uh, agencies for participatory forest management. This is relatively recent in, in its development in Laos since the mid-90s. It's n really not well established yet, and it still faces many challenges, but there's a very uh, ambitious goal to extend that throughout the country, uh, particularly, particularly in uh, production forest areas. It should be mentioned, however, that the context of this research, which focuses on dry dipterocarp forests, is largely, is not covered by a lot of the, these policies, because most of them lay, lie outside of conservation and production forest areas, because they're they've traditionally not been viewed as a very valuable resource, and this is partially why we are doing this research. To give you a little bit of a context on the land grab uh, context of Laos, uh, this is on, based on some research, uh, recent research by, the, by colleagues at the Center for uh, Development and, and Environment at the University of Bern. Um, a large amount of land uh, is being, uh, has been converted in the last decade, roughly equal to 5% of the, of the nation's uh, land surface. Most of that is aimed at foreign direct investment rather than national investment, and particularly investors from uh, Vietnam, China, and Thailand. Through the 90s, this was primarily aimed at the north, and much of that was also timber logging concessions and rubber plantation development. Increasingly now, and this is where our case study takes place, we're looking at central and southern Laos, <clears throat> and particularly where this, this is the economic corridor, that this is Laos is in pink, there's major economic corridor with new highways, several major bridges connecting Bangkok, southern central Laos to major markets in, in Vietnam. And so this is accelerating demand for uh, land both from both Vietnamese and Thai investors in central and southern Laos. This is, a, uh, a, this is the province where we are working, of Savannah Ket. That highway cuts across roughly this line of, this, uh, line of, uh, of uh, latitude. 
um, between the two stars, cuts right across the north. <clears throat> the three case studies that we were asked to uh, focus on by the policymakers was to were to focus on the three primary uh, contrasts that they are facing. The two main source, the two main uh, land conversions in Savannah Kit are for eucalyptus and sugarcane uh, plantations, and then there is a village that is seen as a dry dipterocarp village. Uh, You'll notice all of them lay outside of the green zones. Green zones are either the dark green are protected areas, the light green are production forest areas which have a certain conservation status. Most dry dipterocarp forests lie outside of those because both to conservationists and to foresters, they, they've generally uh, been regarded with, with of limited value. And this is a major reason for why the forestry department asked for this research to be done because they were concerned that lacking any protective status, these areas would be prone to uh, conversion. And introduction to dry dipter carp forests, as, as I wasn't familiar with them before I started this project myself, <coughs> it's not terribly clear, but this is a mature forest, the top two corners. These are mature forests. They, they are extremely slow growing species, average maturity. Um, or average uh, harvestable age is uh, at 110 years when they reach roughly a DBH of 25 centimeters. So these are on very shallow soils that are prone to flooding and drought and have regular fire regimes. Um, typically they, they frequently look quite scraggly and stunted in appearance and therefore for foresters and many policy makers they, they don't appear to be of, of very significant value. The bottom two Contexts are what is increasingly being seen. Conversion to, well, you can't see it very well, conversion to eucalyptus plantation and uh, sugarcane plantations. <coughs> Some key um, forest products that, have, that, that, stake, that people have known that for a while uh, of, to be of importance that come from dry dipper carp forests are mushrooms, frogs, uh, beetles, a lot of uh, insect larvae, uh, of many kinds. Um, Kisi is a damar resin used in uh, lacquerware and various types of um, um, pharmaceuticals, and a lot of vegetables and mushrooms and flowers that, that are actively consumed locally as well as exported to Thailand and Vietnam. However, these frequently remain invisible. They're, they're collected by invisible actors, frequently by women, maybe even children. Um, they may not be traded in, 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 in capturable markets contexts where they can be measure, measured. Much of, them, much of it is consumed in the household. And therefore, the policymakers were concerned that as these are invisible values, um, these, these uh, forests are particularly in danger of being converted. So the research, overarching research question of this project was to uh, look at how do forests enhance resilience of, agri of the agricultural sector to climate change? had several subcomponents. How, how does climate change predict, project it to impact livelihood resilience? How do dry dipter carp forests contribute to the resilience of communities? And what are the impacts of dry dipter carp forest conversion to sugarcane and eucalyptus on resilience? This can be somewhat demonstrated in a matrix where we, we looked at uh, the, the, st the status in three communities, one the dry dipterocarp one, another one with sugarcane eucalyptus under different climate change scenarios. In this presentation, we're not going to focus on the climate change and land use scenarios per se. We'll focus mainly on the status as it is at, as, as we found them here. Methodolo methodologically, um, this, is, this is somewhat preliminary research aimed at, at identifying the key questions that need to be understood for, by policymakers that need to be invested in. So um, extensive participatory rapid appraisal using the Pro4 uh, Poverty and uh, Forest Toolkit were used with uh, uh, stakeholder groups from different wealth groups, uh, wealth categories, and uh, gendered groups. From within them, a selection of households were selected to get more detailed uh, socioeconomic, uh, demographic, uh, rice consumption, uh, and nutritional consumption data. And these were validated in local district province stakeholder workshops. First of all, a major difference um, between the three communities. The PSFM is the uh, Program for Sustainable Forest Management. Then you have eucalyptus and uh, sugarcane. The amount of communal forest land is significantly larger in the, the, the PSFM. Um, community uh, in comparison with where my Moscow with eucalyptus, which does still have some, 
uh, real forest land, so that excludes the plantation, and sugar cane has very little. There are other differences that we won't go into detail here, but I'll point out PSFM, they have a much greater amount of paddy available to them than do the others, but uh, something to be explored further is that you know, their, their yields are much lower than the others, so there's greater intensification of production than the others. In contrast, in <clears throat> the concession communities, this is, uh, the, this is the amount of, uh, of hectares of land uh, on, a, uh, on a per household basis that they have, they have lost to the concession. There are clear income disparities. If you look at purely cash income, uh, there are clear disparities. Uh, the SUFOR, this is the, it's another, sorry, it's another acronym for the, for the same uh, group here. Um, their income, average income, is well below the other communities. And within each of the, the wealth groupings, they're, they're clearly below the other communities. And this would fit very well into a narrative of the poverty environmental uh, cre nexus. However, questioning that myth, uh, when we, we, we uh, calculated consum consumption, uh, collection and sale of, uh, uh, or n not sale, consumption of uh, rice and non-timber forest products, um, cash plus non-cash income brings the total income values roughly to very similar levels. Although the d reliance by the, by the dry dip to carb village uh, is clearly much more on non-cash income. It's almost an inverse relationship compared with the concession villages. <clears throat> so therefore, one might say, well, you know, then what's the big deal? There's really not much of an issue. They're roughly, they have roughly the same uh, income, so we shouldn't be too worried about, uh, about the impacts. Question is, though, uh, what are the costs and benefits and for whom within the community? Um, this research does not, the, lim the sampling in terms of households is very limited, so we can't make very strong statements about a lot of these wealth impacts. Um, however, there are a couple of key, um, ver key um, patterns that we saw that we thought were interesting, and particularly interesting to pursue in, in future research. <clears throat> One major narrative that we found in the communities is that they were concerned about losing diversity of, of what they were consuming. The, and in the most of these communities, they, the, in the concession communities, they indicate that they don't actually generally replace lost vegetables, wild vegetables with purchased vegetables, for example. Also, their, their protein consumption is vastly reduced. Um, this would seem to be, um, then when, we, when, we, when, we, when we collected data on their actual consumption, uh, this is a, a, of NTFPs, interestingly, and we can't really explain it, um, the poor are not the largest consumers of NTFPs, actually the middle, middle wealth classes that appear to be consuming more, vastly more NTFPs than anyone else. And in the sugarcane village, which has almost no f uh, forest left, there's uh, the di differences between the, the different wealth groups is, is not very, is not, not as significant. But this is annual consumption. And so this might, this belies the seasonality effects. There are, there are clear seasons where, where, peop where, where stakeholders have a greater or lesser reliance on, on uh, NTFPs. Similarly, we looked at rice consumption. <clears throat> the, no the national norm that, they, that the government expects uh, people to uh, consume is 350 uh, kilograms per capita per year. And overall, they're quite, they're quite close to that, uh, even in, in all the communities, except for these, wealth, these wealthy groups that, appear to cons that claim to consume a vast amount more of rice. But again, while the, they, they appear to be close to the, the annual norm, um, Annu the seasonal shortages are, are clearly discussed by, by communities and so that therefore do not appear in this data. One of the more surprising uh, unexpected kind of uh, outcomes of this research was the importance of livestock assets. Um, and we would posit this as a potential measure in terms of a uh, resilience to shocks. This is not actually a production system, it's mainly a savings system, but the value of, of these livestock in, in comparison to their annual cash income is quite significant. In the dry dip to carb forest village, um, the average, again, from the limited household sample that we have, the average uh, value equivalent of their of, uh, livestock in, in, cash, in, their, in terms of their cash equivalent is uh, 3.6 years of, of annual income. Um, in the eucalyptus village, this goes an average down to one, similarly down in sugarcane village. 
what it, these are these are recent developments, though, and it would, and it is clear that the poor in all these in these latter two communities are being forced to sell off more of their livestock. And in this, in the Sugarcane Village, they already have, and so the and in both of these communities, the um, the carrying capacity is well exceeded by the number of livestock that they have, and they really rely on past, seeking pasture in neighboring villages in order to um, in order to uh, maintain their their livestock. So, uh, one other uh, point that was raised, you know, the the for by having the forest, they have seasonal access to to income. Uh, it helps to meet their 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 seasonal and uh, uh, short term needs, and therefore the communities stay together. This was somewhat borne out in terms of labor contribution. Um, there is a greater reliance in in the eucalyptus and sugarcane villages on both labor income and as well as remittance income. Although it wasn't. The remittance was not as, as significant as, as we had you know, come somewhat expected. And dry dipped or carb forest, oh, there, it, was, it was less than the others. So then we looked at um, concession, uh, uh, concession outcomes. The availability of, of data from the actual concessions where we were working was an issue. We couldn't get access to the actual concession data that was quite sensitive. So we had to look for other examples. Uh, we found small scale, far small scale sugarcane farmers in the area, as well as another concession, not the one that where we were looking at, and a baseline of the Thai system that appears to be quite functional. <clears throat> in all of the in all of the Lao case, the three Lao case studies, the two small scale and the larger scale one, the net pr it, it appears to be a, somewhat a losing investment. Um, and it it's not clear exactly what the primary source of the issue what the primary source is, whether it's a question of the, the technology and knowledge and skills whether it's particular susceptibility to, to the white leaf uh, disease, or whether, uh, I mean, but the clear is, you know, the break even point is that you need a much higher yield per, per hectare to make this even, to, to make this work out. And in the Lao context, the, the yield is very low. So they're not, not exactly clear what the major issue, is, the explanatory variable is. E eucalyptus, we could find even less data. Um, however, in terms of uh, contributions to households, there's almost no labor um, demand for eucal in the eucalyptus plantations. Similarly, in the sugarcane plantations, I, um, I should have mentioned that that labor statistic. None of that money came from the concessions. The previous one is al almost all of the money came from other labor activities, and so for households, the the, lo the loss of the of their lands to concessions is not is not translating into rural development objectives. So. Lessons learned in terms of the economics of the large-scale concessions. It would appear that the, the dry dipter carb forest soils might make any, the conversion for, particularly for sugarcane and eucalyptus, maybe not so for cassava, but ma make those uh, somewhat uncertain investments. Um, major issue in, La in Laos is poor documentation, inaccessibility of data, uh, make, and, and that contributes to uh, the creation of conflicts between concessions and local communities. Um, this is a major issue in, 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 in doing any kind of assessment in Laos. Um, and there is very limited employment offered by them. Uh, in addition, in terms of these direct impacts, this is having a spillover effect that the communities where the, that, that are in proximity of concessions are increasingly privatizing any remaining communal forest land out of fear that because they, they, they have no confidence that their forests will, be, will not be uh, granted by any one of many institutions that can that can grant concessions in Laos. Um, increasingly, the commons are being lost because people are privatizing and fencing it. In some cases, even just logging it just to be able to and planting some eucalyptus, not for the economic benefits, but just to be able to stake the claim. So, forest loss through concessions is resulting in tragedy of the remaining commons. It would appear. So tentative conclusions on, on household resilience. Forest communities, they clearly rely um, most on non-cash income, whereas concession communities rely more on cash income. Um, but overall, the incomes are relatively close. But so this would kind of countervail the, the poverty environment nexus theories. And all of these are tentative. There are question marks at, er, almost at every one of them. So we, I would value any feedback that you have in terms of better explanations. All the communities and wealth, cl wealth classes seem to rely significantly on forests for both non-cash and cash income. This seems to confirm expectations from other publications. Rice consumption uh, appears adequate everywhere, with particular uh, excesses in the concession villages. I don't, 
this might be a question of sampling or uh, how the framing of the questions was done, um, but it, 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 that we're, we can't truly explain it. Um, but there, it should be noted there are very different yield levels in these communities. Um, so there's significant area for improvement in, in their yields. Highest and surprisingly, the highest NTFP consumption is among the middle wealth class. And that's really, it might, is this a question of sampling? Is this a question of the lower ability of the, of the poorer households to estimate their, their quantification? This, is, this was a single survey estimating annual, um, annual uh, consumption. So it's really not clear what that meant. Concession communities, they report shortages in seasonal availability of forest products, yet, I mean, the, um, and, and they, they claim that, you know, they, they see a negative impact on dietary diversity and on their uh, weekly, monthly household cash income um, uh, needs, but they have overall similar levels of, of produce consumption. It may be one additional um, explanatory variable, maybe the fact that in these communities, People are just not very happy. <laughs> in, in, uh, they, either they, they, they really have a, a strongly negative relationship with this, this eucalyptus co co uh, concession company, where there's a lot of conflicts. In the case of the sugarcane concession, where they've lost more forest, they were actually consulted with, but they didn't realize they had a choice in to, to, to reduce the, 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 um, the, the concession scale. So, but overall, their, their perceptions of their livelihoods may just be very negative. Um, so that may have an impact on their perception of well-being. Um, poor uh, the poor in the concession communities rely most on migrant and day labor income. This doesn't appear to be surprising. It's surprising that it doesn't, that it's not more. Um, and it, this was uh, more significant than expected, but we're not, I'm not exactly sure how to model this or as it's not a production system, the livestock are not really a production system, it's really, it's a, it, but it represents a significant buffer uh, in terms of overcoming uh, significant shocks to, to uh, the system. So forests provide a significant shocks through provision of, of livestock um, fodder. <coughs> um, major constraint is that communities are ignorant of any rights or understanding of the legal mechanisms for protecting their, their land, uh, land um, allocations. Their, Maps are drawn by various projects, and then they disappear. Uh, no one has a copy of them. Um, they, there's, there are major issues with uh, that. These are major issues that result in conflict and, and make it impossible for communities to really um, uh, to contest uh, claims by concession holders. There's extremely poor coordination between uh, agencies. Uh, district agencies allowed to set and make an allocation of 100, up to 100 hectares. Province up to 1,000. 1,000 hectares, the national government up to 10,000. But there's no coordination among them, and there's no central registry, and there's no monitoring of how those are implemented in the field. So these are major issues uh, constraining planners' abilities to make uh, rational decisions. So a couple of key priority, priority questions for policymakers um, to answer in order to know how to deal with, this, particularly the dry dip context, because the the opportunities for ca other cash cropping uh, are, are more limited. Um, how much paddy land should be allocated per household or, or per capita to ensure future ho uh, food self-sufficiency? How much dry dip or carb forest should be preserved per household if you wanted to maintain a buffer for resilience? Then in relating more to concessions, what criteria should be applied to ensure that companies demonstrate the viability of their concessions? It's, it's not a secret that in many, many concessions are, are granted in Laos have nothing to do with the viability of that concession. There are other objectives where they're getting, the company may be getting other deals that have nothing to do with this concession. So, but I'm not saying that this is the case in these two companies, but it is very clear that there's, there's limited cost, uh, cost benefit analysis or, or uh, uh, viability analysis by these concessions of these concessions themselves. Their overall strategy may be sound, but it's not, it's not necessarily achieving the impact here. Um, what kind of com compensation should uh, the concessions uh, provide to replace the benefits? And what kind of institutional monitoring and arbitration adjudication mechanisms are needed to safeguard the interests of communities? Lacking in any of the above, how does the government plan to address demand for employment by, uh, if low rural livelihoods are undermined? Um, so those were some of the key questions that we, we, we uh, uh, felt needed to be addressed. I welcome any questions or any comments.